welcome all the artists and students and lovers of the arts that are here with us this afternoon. Um, this is, of course, uh, the next installment in a series of webinars that the National Arts Festival is running. Uh, we've heard from theatre administrators and the National Arts Festival administrators and managers and people dealing with rights and copyrights and stuff. This time we are dealing with artists, for the artists, by the artists. So we look very much forward to engaging with our panel. Right. Uh, one other thing I just want to announce before we get going, as you might uh, be aware, yesterday the festival announced a new platform, another platform for pre-recorded digital work. This is called the Fringe, the Virtual Fringe, I beg your pardon, or V Fringe for short. This has been developed to help artists generate income from work that is presented online. There's no registration fee to use the platform, and artists will receive 90% of the income generated by their ticket sales. It will be run through the National Arts Festival website, not through YouTube, which will not give you 90% of tickets sold at all. Um, all the relevant forms, the online forms, as well as information uh, is on the National Arts Festival website. Have a look for it under the Artists Info and link. But let's get back to this webinar and the process of this. My name is Rob Murray. I am a theater maker, I'm an educator, and I'm a researcher. And we are I work currently at After Johannesburg, and we are busy rolling out a hybrid online learning pedagogy that uh, so this very idea of creating content and putting it online is foremost in our minds at all time what we are going to be talking about today is to give you the artists an insight into how to go about putting work online how you might need to start shifting your thinking about the creative process what is it really about what are some of the challenges what are some of the hilarious failures? What's the goss out there? I'd like to take this moment now to introduce our panel. Um, talk, uh, first up, Nikki Pink Pilkington. Thank you very much for joining us today, Nikki. There you are up there. Born and bred in the boiling pot Afropolitan of Johannesburg, Nikki's a theater maker and a filmmaker with an interest in conscious collaborations, both in process and between disciplines. I believe you have a short presentation for us. Nikki, thank you very much for being with us this afternoon. Thanks, uh, Rob. Thank you. All right, like so. Start us up, yeah. Yes. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Um, I'm really stoked to be a part of this conversation with some really exciting people. Um, all right. So as Rob has mentioned, I am a theatre maker and a filmmaker with an interest in between um, the kind of fusion of these forms. And for a long time, I kind of thought that I had to keep these worlds separate. Um, and it was in 2014 when I first saw the National Theatre Live, uh, Josie Rooks Coriolanus, that I was like, hold on, this is really exciting. I'm watching theatre from a different country in the cinema. Um, and from there have been exposed to some really exciting fusions of the live and the digital, um, including some of Is Devlin's projection work, the work that's happening at Fakugezi and the Tamolohong precinct, as well as uh, the Center for the Less Good Idea, which we might hear a little bit more later. Um, and um, yeah, after a while I was like, okay, cool, how can I start to do some of that for myself? Um, so I approached some of my collaborators and uh, the first kind of project that I started with the fusion of these two things was with a performance artist named Opa Sebeko, who did a performance art series called The Reeds of Ikawe. And I thought it was really interesting that he drew on the modern Japanese form of buto, um, which is this really cool experiential live um, performance form. Um, and I was like, okay, how could I translate this into the film form? How can I use time and space and proximity in a different way to start experimenting with what it means to see Buto in the film form? So um, I kind of started um, to experiment with this kind of dance on screen form of live performance. Um, and a little while after that, 
um, a really dope queen named Monia Kabwe um, spoke to me and she said, listen, I want to play with you. I think, you know, my research into African futures and live performance could really go well with the kind of tip you're on. So I was like, yes, let's play. Um, and it kind of, yeah, has uh, come to a beautiful kind of uh, relationship of several forms. Um, first, we started with uh, a whole lot of performance lectures where we played with her in kind of multiple frames. Um, first was at the Live Arts Network Africa launch where she was speaking a little bit about her research. And another one was where she was doing a PhD seminar and we kind of thought it was like a really cathartic experience to play with the, the Skype kind of format itself um, and have her talking to herself, talking over to herself, you know, someone's late and I'm sure a lot of the Zoom politics that everyone is experiencing these days. Um, and it was really nice to kind of <laughs> experiment with that. And then it kind of climaxed in a really exciting project that happened at the beginning of last year that I really was quite galvanized by to really push this kind of fusion and it's kind of what I want to chat and kind of uh, chat about and kind of share. So we did a production called Babylon Beyond Borders, which was a four way simulcast productions on four different stages geographically. So essentially um, it was performances between Johannesburg, New York, Sao Paulo and um, London interacting with each other. And simultaneously it was being broadcast across the world. So I had friends that were, you know, WhatsApping me and being like, oh my gosh, I'm in India and I can see what's happening. I'm in France, I'm in Cape Town. It was really exciting. Um, and there was a whole lot of other uh, elements that kind of came into that. But essentially, um, it, uh, it explored the ideas of Babylon and utopias and connections and uh, the limitations of being able to do, to do things, as well as the possibilities of what it means to connect through technology. Um, and so here are a little bit of like behind the scenes images of what we experimented with. And the kind of last thing that I wanted to end off in telling my story was that um, what Opa and Wenya brought was the possibility to collaborate. It wasn't just a, hey, Nikki, I'm thinking of like putting up a camera at the back of the theater and filming this, it'll be really cool. Or I wanna project something at the back of the, you know, the back of the stage. But rather yeah. right from the, the beginning, it was seeded that we were going to collaborate and find a way and find a language because these things aren't, you know, we're still figuring it out. Um, and essentially it was really nice to find a marriage of the form through the process itself, which I'm still experimenting with and learning. Um, yeah, so that's who I am. Thanks, Rob. Brilliant, thank you very much, Nikki. We will be hearing a lot more from you uh, shortly. Thank you. I'd like to now introduce you all to Tandile Mbache, performance artist, choreographic activist, speaker, brand ambassador, model, and voiceover artist. Tandile, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon and look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you so much, Rob, and thank you to the National Arts Festival for this platform. It's really exciting and I'm very excited to be here with all you fabulous panelists and my colleagues, right? So um, I'm going to share a little bit of my personal um, performance or, or, or um, create, creative process. And I'm going to start off by foregrounding a little bit um, with Stefan Koslin, who is a, um, a psychologist from um, Harvard, who really writes on um, ideas, on ideas and how to, I guess, conceive and generate and such, right? Um, Stefan, um, Stefan or Koslin identifies four steps um, for this, but I'm really just going to look at two of those. And another scholar, Naima Sawa, a Ghanaian scholar, Professor Sawa from Boulder University in Colorado, who I was, I happened to be in a, in a seminar with in 2012 or 13, I was probably in second year, um, and actually a workshop, and they shared something I've, I've held onto forever. So I have a, a couple of steps that I go through. Um, they're not, yeah, it's just my, so ritual is number one, right? Um, I think it is very important, especially for this time we're in now, all this uncertainty that is happening. We need a ritual. Indoor um, similelengayo, as Kosene, we would say, um, a rod or a support system, 
you've got to, I think it's very important for artists to have that and, and I guess anybody, right? Um, and that, that, that ritual is, is for you to get into yourself, for you to, um, to get, you, using the environment around you and everything that is happening um, and not blocking it out. We have this thing of wanting to block out what is happening around us and not actually using it to our advantage. This will bring me straight to Prof, Prof um, Sawa's um, analogy of walking around with a bucket as a traveler or say you are, you're harvesting. Um, if we're looking at the word harvest, we're talking about we, you only when you harvest, you want the best. You're not going to go to the, uh, a tree and pick a rotten apple, right? Mm. So you are looking, about, you're looking at your environment and using, taking your environment, taking the good out of your environment to be generative for you. Coslin's the two steps for Coslin. I'm, I'm only looking at the first and the last. Um, the, the need to generate, right? Um, and he mentions from memory, experience, or and activity. And the last one is to transform your idea to, after you've generated the idea, transform the idea and alter it to suit your purpose, right? So you're going around, you're harvesting, you're taking, you're walking. You, it's like um, you, the saying, when in Rome, do as Romans know. You go to Rome, you look, you look at what the Romans are doing and you take what works for you and you put it in your bucket, right? And that constitutes your constitution, your personal constitution. I'm very big on this thing of ritual. Um, get into it, hold on to it. We need this kind of, I think, now more than ever, to have that song you listen to that will pick you up, that, 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 that scent, um, that, that thing you do, that, 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 that practice you get into for you to, 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 to create space, which brings me to my second point. Creating space for yourself to be present in the moment. We worry so much about yesterday and tomorrow when we can't really do anything about those but the now. So you, 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 you get into that ritual to create space for yourself to, to, to really be present in the now. And that thing really helps you to, to appreciate um, the now because you know it is fleeting. I know this happens a lot. I remember when I was younger, as a young performer, I would always be freck scared to, put, to get on stage. And then I grew up to realize that, look, this thing only lasts for about 10 minutes maximum, right? And I just need to be in, in it and enjoy it because it is really fleeting. Point number, and then once you create that space for yourself, so I go into our bathroom, I take, spend two hours washing there, I put on Zomu Tikha's music and I put on Imbe Poyam and I've created that space for myself to, to generate, right? Now, this, that brings me to point three. Then you are able to generate ideas, right? Because you've cleared your mind, you are not blocking out what is happening around you, you're actually using it to your best advantage. Um, and then I, I think of collaborating and participating. Nikki and Nicola um, mentioned this earlier. Collaborating and um, I'm calling on like-minded people, insisting on that thing of calling on like-minded people to be a part of this thing. You can't do everything on your own. There's somebody there that can do your costume, your PR, your everything. Of course, we then, and an artist will ask me about resources. Insist to your funders that this is the the cohort you're working with, and this is your best place to be generative so that you can disseminate duties. Point number five. So my work is very, very much, um, so I didn't do a, I, I'm, I'm leading on Rob's introduction of myself, right? <laughs> so I'm, I'm very um, interested right now um, with the, the image and idea of emerging. Ingondoha is, is an unfavor, is unfavorable landscape, right? Um, and as a queer body, my work is definitely only looking at seeking, at, uh, seeking to find the answers to how queer bodies are self-actualizing in an unfavorable environment that is society, okay? So... I'm not looking at the superfluous um, coming out of the closet for your family and whatnot. Um, it is really about the process of Ukupuma. Um, what, what is the terrain like? What, what is indigenous to which space where you find yourself in, right? Um, and how you insert yourself in, the, in that space. Um, number six is be proactive. Um, it is obviously very difficult to do this very often, but I really think it, it helps. Once you say it first and then you 
people will follow, right? Be proactive, take a chance on yourself, take a chance on your ideas, believe in your ideas. Um, I can't stress that even more. Um, and then the struggles and resources and logistics, right? That's my last point. Um, what do we, I mean, yes, there are struggles um, and I will speak more on this Rob later, but um, the struggles, uh, yeah, the struggles just, just um, I don't know. I, I personally don't look at it as a struggle. I try not to. It's a very um, cliche, a huge cliche, this thing of taking the positive of it out of it, where you're going. But really, I live by it. Um, Prof Sawa's way of thinking of just being in an environment, don't take what will work for you and use that. Use, put it in your repository of, I, of your constitution and move on. Yes. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, Tanile. That's such a lovely... Uh, that image of emerging, I think that's definitely something that we're all uh, engaging with. Absolutely. We will hear more from you later. Fantastic. Uh, next up, uh, I would like to introduce Rob van Fieren. Uh, the le Do I have to say legendary? Do I? Really? <laughs> legendary South African actor, writer, director, comedian, and film star who has participated in no less than 25 National Arts Festivals in Makanda. Rob, thank you so very much for joining us this afternoon. Uh, yeah, over to you. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, thank you for reading the legendary part. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't make that the first word in my bio uh, very specifically. Actually, I didn't write it. I didn't write that. Uh, uh, I'll accept that bottle of wine whenever. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> Uh, uh, hi to all the rest of the panelists. I'm very, um, I'm very stoked to be speaking uh, with all of you guys, um, and to everyone listening out there. Thanks for having me. I, I, I guess I just want to do, just touch on what I think I've learned so far in this lockdown period, creating a work um, and how to approach it. You know, as as an artist. And I think, um, um, I think a lot of what we're going to say is going to resonate with each other and it's going to be stuff that I think as artists we've already picked on already as, as Nicola and Tandila were speaking. I was like, yeah, uh, that's exactly the kind of insights that I've had into it. And it's uh, really interesting. So yeah, uh, this is my spiel. I think number one as artists, um, you've got to prioritize your, your mental and your physical health. Number one, step one, like really look after yourself and just stop for a second. Uh, uh, Tanina was talking a lot about ritual and I, I completely agree with that. I think it's so important to implement a very basic, manageable, but also non-negotiable self-care regime with yourself. And it, like, it, you know, use whatever, whatever works for you. Cherry pick whatever makes you just kind of cope and get through the day. And it can be super, super basic. Um, some sort yeah. of exercise or activity that gets you out of your head into your body and into the present moment. I think that's super, super important. And above all, as artists, we need to be gentle with ourselves and to acknowledge the trauma we are currently experiencing. I think we need to take a moment to grieve what used to be because it's gone. Um, and whether it's coming back again in four months or eight or 12 or two years or never, is kind of irrelevant right now because right now here it's gone. Um, and I think if we can take that moment to breathe and to acknowledge our trauma, we as artists can build from there, from a place of uh, uh, self-care, presence, acceptance, curiosity. And I think that we may find that we are at the genesis of what may well turn out to be one of the most creatively abundant, innovative, revolutionary moments in arts and entertainment that we will ever experience in our lifetimes. This is the most disruptive thing to ever happen to the arts industry. And from that disruption is going to be incredible, exciting new art that's gonna emerge. And I think we can all be a part of it. Uh, obviously, there are there are limitations, um, but I think you can you if you use your network, like Tandile suggested, if you if you if you disseminate and if you embrace, um, I think you can get by with very little. Uh, if you just have some sort of access to a smartphone or a camera, and even intermittent access to the internet, you, you can make stuff, and you can be a part of the revolution. 
what is so exciting about it for me is there are no rules right now. There are no experts. There are no gatekeepers. There is, it's, it's wide open. It's absolutely wide open. The ground is shifting beneath our feet like every second. And that for an artist, I think is actually really, really exciting if, if we can embrace it. My experience is so to this point, in terms of creating content, specifically comedy, has been incredibly rewarding and, and incredibly exciting. And I'd like to go into more detail about that. But like initially, my experience was like panic, uh, fear, tragedy. I shut down for two weeks. I just tried to build up like some semblance of, of, of sanity. And then through curiosity, sort of developed. I tried stuff. I tried stand up. I thought it was hideous. There was no laugh coming back to me. I thought, okay, that doesn't work. You've got to take it off the list. Subsequent to that, as I've been experimenting and just embracing the problem, um, I've realized anything can work. And I've gone back to doing stand up and through recalibrating basic things like rhythm and tone, I've realized, oh, it does actually work. And, and, and you've got to be so adaptable to the space in terms of um, the multitude of platforms that we are going to be performing at and are already performing on and how that changes your, your dynamics and your delivery from a, a rhythm, rhythmic tonal perspective is, 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 is malleable all the time. Like, for instance, the, the comedy thing, initially with stand-up on, on uh, like, many platforms, you can't hear the laugh. And you think, well, that's intrinsic to stand-up comedy rhythm. Um, but then you realize, okay, so that's a reciprocal rhythm that happens in the live situation in the club. If you're performing it online, you need to now own that extra beat that the audience would be giving you and assimilate it into your new rhythm. Uh, and you do that by driving through your punchline and landing on your segue driving into theme, taking off on that and not waiting for that reciprocal beat that you would normally get after a punchline in a laugh or throwing away your punchline. Like technical little adjustments like that I think can be uh, 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 kind of used on, in so many of the different arts if we just kind of embrace the problem and go, okay, well, how do we, how do we adjust now to this? Um, the most exciting things that I, I've my experience so far is doing most amazing show stuff where it's two of us in two separate locations doing a comedy double act where we've, we've tried to really embrace the limitations, like really stay in the problem of like, okay, well, how do we make, how do we make this work? And what are the tricks we can, we can do? And how do we make physical comedy work? How do we make uh, visual gags work? How do we make the rhythm of our comedy work? And we've just had so much fun creating uh, and solving problems. Um, so, for instance, it's a split screen, but on the, on the, on the platform that we're currently using, uh, what we see on screen is not what the audience is seeing on screen. So we had to establish, okay, what is the audience seeing? Where am I? If I'm here, my partner is to the right of me or to the left of me? Where is the middle? Where does, where's, where's the middle? So then we established that and then we interact with each other as, uh, even if I'm, if it's counterintuitive and you're looking in the opposite direction of what you, what you should be doing. And then you play with eye lines and then you can have little conversations. You can pass stuff to each other. Those things that you pass to each other th through the screen can change. All sorts of like visual, physical comedy gags are suddenly available to you that you can play with. Lo, who's Cornet in the Most Amazing Show, has built these elaborate little sets in his garage where he's got, we've got little Cornet and Twacky puppets that, we can do a segment of the show where we turn the camera around and he's built this little set and the phone sits there and now you see the set and you can, we can do a puppet show. He's then built a couple of different sets where we can, he's got like a zoetrope. He's built, built a, a moving background and then all of a sudden you've got a scene where these puppets are running and the background is moving or like a zoom thing where he's just actually bringing the background picture in closer to the, to the static thing there. He's done a top shot, falling shots where he's done exactly the same thing. And, and all these things are, is, is just from a perspective of following your curiosity and embracing the problem. And there's so much, there's so much fun in that. And there's so much new magic that's, that's in that. I could talk about that, those different little aspects for, for days and days and days, but I, I guess I must cut it short. Um, uh, uh, what else did I want to say? Um, Yeah, I think it's about embracing the, the, the restrictions that 
that we have. Like, don't fight it. Don't, don't think about the old world. It's gone. Like this mm. is the new world. How do we cheat it? And we've, I don't think, I think we've never been closer to our audience in many respects and have more direct access to them in a wider net without the, um, the gatekeepers in the way. And it's a very, very exciting time. And we can reach, uh, I'm so jealous of Nicola because she's been practicing this stuff before it even happened. Um, but we can reach so many different people anywhere in the world. We did a show the other night. We had people in Canada, uh, the UK, the Philippines, and Antarctica. There was someone in Antarctica watching us live in real time. And pe the live experience is not gone. It's, it, people are craving it. They yeah. want it. They need it. They need to connect with their communities and they connect their, with their communities through art, through entertainment. And that's exactly what they're doing. And there's interesting things about that. At the moment, they're not worried about quality of content. What's more important to them is immediacy of contact. And so it's a time for us to go in there. My motto from the start has been fail spectacularly. Just, just do it. If you've, if you've good within yourself and you've done the self care, just, just follow your curiosity, do what's fun, the path of least resistance and, and make mistakes the perfect time to make mistakes very very exciting that's all i've got to say for now uh thank you so much rob we will get back to you um but jill lots to chew on there we can yeah get you back for a part three for this <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thanks we will hear more from you later uh right now i would like to introduce everybody to mandisi giantis who is a composer a trumpet trumpeter beg your pardon vocalist and a student of the arts who has been doing some um, lovely stuff at the Cape Town International Jazz Festival and the live sessions there on YouTube. Mandisi, thank you so much for being with us this afternoon. We really appreciate it and over to you. Um, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. Uh, it's really uh, an honor. Um, my name is Mandisi Gangis and I'm a musician um, from from writing, you know, a, a piece of music um, or arranging a, a piece of music, one is constantly thinking of who will be in that, you know, piece of music, you know, who will play with you, um, how it's going to sound, where so-and-so comes in and plays, you know, sometimes you write a, a piece of music with people in mind already, you know. Uh, I've been working with the, with the, with the same uh, quintet for the longest time so when i write a new song i can hear how the piano player is going to do it or the bass player or the drama um, um also in my theater work i've been working with the same theater group you know so as you're writing a, a, a piece of work you know how a certain singer will sound you know um uh, so being thrown into this um a period of time where all of that was suddenly taken away you know, um, for me, it was scary at first. You're like, oh gosh, what am I going to do? I'm all alone now. Um, I've got all these um, songs. I've got all this work that I've, 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 I've written for people. You know, I've written with people in mind. What do I do? You know, and the first thing you do is you, you call into a shell and, and, and you think nothing positive will ever come out of this, you know. Um, but then very soon, you know, um, uh, also just being in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in world music and understanding how other people have been doing it because streaming live music has been happening, you know, it, of course it's been happening with audiences in, in rooms, you know, if I've been watching a lot of, uh, concert, uh, with the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra, you know, I've been watching a lot of, um, the concert at Dizzy's in New York. I've been watching a lot of um, at Bird's Eye in, in Switzerland, but there's always been an element of an audience in the room. I've just been, you know, the other side. So now we, I need, we needed, we, I mean, the team needed to come in terms with the fact that now we were going to be playing and the only audience we were going to have is the audience in our mind, you know, and imagining it. And, and so for musicians who are always on the go, we go and, and present music um, in a club there. We go and present music in a concert hall, or you know, we go to another country and present. It, it sort of feels like a shift because the music now is traveling for itself. You know, you don't you don't need to travel. And and for 
um, people have never done it. It feels funny when you're playing in the same place. Uh, let's say we we did up, you know, we you do a couple you do a couple of gigs uh, or a couple of presentation in one uh, venue, uh, and for you to think that that mu that music is traveling further than you, it's traveling further than you could even think. It's, you don't you don't know where it's been. You know that's a new thing, and, and that's the thing that artists should understand and and sort of um, it needs to now feel natural that the art is doing the work for itself. All now that you need to concentrate on is the quality of the art, is your sincerity to the art, is your sincerity to the process of creating and, and sharing the art. Because yes, it's nice when you play uh, or you, you, you're performing and the audiences are, are there, you can, tend, you, you can feel their attention or, or in the jazz clubs that we're playing in, people chirping, you know, between, um, uh, between songs and introduce songs and, and Robert just said the laughs and the reactions and all of those things. It's beautiful. It's, it's, it's been a part of, it's a part of the art that, that we love because it, 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 it sort of um, nurtures us, you know. Um, but now we should understand that that hasn't stopped. You know, we played a gig. We 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 played a gig, and um and we were the we were the only people in 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 the sort of venue. Uh, we didn't know what was happening because we had closed all the the comments and all of the, uh, these things, and and because we just wanted to play the music and sincere in the music and concentrate on how the music made us feel and how it 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 it, it wanted to come out at that moment, uh, and. We didn't know where, where it had gone, you know. Whereas if 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 we're playing in a small venue in Cape Town or Joburg, um, you know that you're playing for those 150 people, or for those 50 people, or for those 200 people, or you're going to a, a theater room, you're playing for those 500 people in a in a, in the night. And what was surprising was the number of people, you know, who who had witnessed, you know, the what one of the one of the of the of the of the live streams that we did is on 47,000 people now, you know. I've never played for 47,000 people. I've never dreamt of playing for 4,000 people in my life, you know. I've played for 200 people, you know. Um, and so, and so, the, but, but these things still don't feel natural for us as artists, you know. And so these are the things that we, we need to, and, and take time in, in understanding them and in going through them. Um, we need to look for, um, um, as Tandila said, collaborators, you know, um, who are, I'm a musician, I can write music, I can play music, I can perform music, I can teach music to other people, but I'm not a streaming artist, you know, I don't, I don't know where to start, you know, I might even mess up the Zoom <laughs> thing that, that we're going on because I, I'm, I'm not good at these things, but there <laughs> are people who are, who are very good at those things, you know, uh, uh, we need to look at for them because the other thing is that uh, as artists we are being caught by surprise you know i did a second streaming where um before we went on there were about 300 people you know so um the streamers had prepared for 300 people to watch um the 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 the, the concert but as soon as it started it shot up to about 900,000 people and 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 so the net the the host could not handle that traffic and it crashed, you know. And so we need to now start to look at what that means, you know, um, our internet lines, our gigabytes, whatever, all those things. There are people who know those things and we need to find them and find the, the, the good ones because I think at, at the more it's going, and I know Rob said uh, people are not um, necessarily um, focusing on the, on, the, on the quality of the, 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 the performances, but the more we spend time in this in this period, you know, people are going to start now looking for the best quality. You know, can I hear you properly? Can I see you properly? Um, um, uh, how's the sound on my phone? If I'm looking on my phone, how's the sound on? Um, am, are you? Why are you always buffering? You know, my Disney shows are always buffering. You know, I'm not watching. I'm, oh, I'm not going to pay that much to watch my Disney buffering. You know, um, and so those are the things that you know we're going to start uh, having to, to to look at. Um, 
and 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 I know I'm, I guess I'm, I'm grateful for being in Cape Town because we've got some some lovely people who are who have been doing this thing for a very long time, and and those are the people that we need to look at how we're going to collaborate, um, and also there needs to be very soon, you know, very soon, um, and I'm glad for this because we need to share you know, share our problems, you know, those of us who are already doing it, share them and share them honestly so that people um, understand because there's also an element of when we want to create this good work, there's a lot of, the, some people are going to have to pay a bit to make it, you know, um, if, if you want to bring it to a certain level of standard because uh, if uh, I heard the guy saying, no, I must have 100 gigs passing through my line to make it, you know, a quality da 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 da, meaning that there's, there's a level of money that has to go there in, if you want to achieve the product that you want to get. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anissi. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you, there's so much in there and, and we also skidding across one of the burning questions of access in this country, yeah. which has been forefront of this whole going online thing and and pushing has pushed us into these areas where it's it becomes unbalanced again you know and it's one of the huge things i know in education at the moment we are are dealing with this you know where we're trying to give data relief or device relief to our students so that they can just attend class uh, performance class performance training or, or other research um and and one of those big debates is that, we have we should maybe do it across the board first yeah. before we even start you know um, and i'm sure this will come up and it'll keep coming up until we until we <laughs> solve this all um <laughs> all right turning now i'd like to introduce everybody to Haley evans um woman of many hats actor theater maker art administrator leader teacher facilitator storyteller <gasps> Probably best known though for the founder and artistic director of Pop Art Theatre, um, but I see also has many other special skills up her sleeve, like the ability to set up a Zoom meeting all by herself, which let's face it, is highly marketable right about now. Haley, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon, and yeah, over to you. Yeah, Welcome. and thank you, thanks for having me, and thank you to all these wonderful, beautiful people for this conversation. Um, I, I like I find myself with all those many hats experiencing it from different sides. So I resonate a lot as an artist um, trying to just figure things out, but also becoming really excited about all the different things that we're now offered, the, the possibilities for collaboration, the kind of the, the kind of deep interrogation we can do of our audiences. Those kinds of things are really cool. Um, and then between that, as a, as a theater owner, um, some might say gatekeeper, <laughs> that, um, the, but the, the interesting thing now is the gatekeepers become access. And what we're trying to do is yeah. create this kind of space between, the, this, like pop art's always been a platform and it's always been quite an accessible platform in Joburg. Um, so we, when this whole, like as a team, when this whole thing started to happen, we, we didn't get stuck in the idea of like, how long is it gonna go? We were just like, okay, cool, this is life. And um, we've had so many beautiful people come to us because they're comfortable with us. We've got a, you know, the benefit of having nine years worth of network of fantastic, um, fringy, make it happen artists who are like, okay, cool, let's, how do, what can we do? How can we play? So, um, yeah, also just an opportunity to, as a, as a space, as a platform, as a digital space, and as an artist to be, to, yeah, experimental, like deeply, deeply experimental. And I guess within our own identity, and I think this has always been the thing between like the, the conundrum of to make or not to make, is our identity as live performers. So yeah. what pop art, and Haley as an artist are very interested in is how we retain elements of liveness throughout. And I think like what Mandisi and Rob were saying in terms of you can feel the audience and like all you needed to do was give it a, one shot um, to see what the, what the response is of this like online gathering 
which in some ways the audience is much louder because someone's now like typing into their keyboard, ha ha, Chris, you beauty, which they're never going to do in the, you know, in a theater or, well, South African audiences are quite different, but yeah. you know, there's, you've now got this very loud, very responsive and very, I find like really happy to be there because of where we're at right now. And I, and I do agree with Mandisi, we are going to have to grow our content and we are gonna to have to become better at this to retain that excitement. But there's also other elements that are going to help us as things go along because we'll be the last to, kind of, we'll, we'll still be entertainment like on, in the digital space until people can go to restaurants. Um, which now they don't have to choose between performance and, you know? So there's okay. those, those kind of opportunities that, you know, can grow as we get better at doing this thing. But for me, the, the big interests are how do we retain elements of liveness? Um, so not to just create pre-recorded content um, and how we can kind of grow the grow the relationship with an audience and a worldwide audience, how we, how we can start to collaborate internationally, which is what some of our projects have been about. Because now if, you know, like we had an improv group that's met for the last 10 years, every Monday night, some people moved countries. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Now they can, now we're all, you know, as, and I find that that's, there's like a, a massive trust and safeness that we have to, that becomes very important in this live space. But then also, you know, this idea of like, how do we make these technical adjustments and how do we play and how do we rehearse and all those things are fun and interesting for the, for the moment. So yeah. And also just as a platform, figuring out what is the stage, what is the backstage and where do the audience sit? Those are like, the interesting thing is that all of that information is available on Google and you can kind of pick and choose based on the work that you want to produce what your stage looks like and what your audience seating looks like. And you can choose to take care of that yourself. And I think as things develop, you could also choose the theater that's right for you as you would have with any other work that you made. Fantastic. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that whole question of the element of liveness is definitely one we should never leave. And you guys have just killed my other questions. I'm just saying. You know. You've taken the complete wind out of my sails, but hey, we're going to have to jump in and access the yeah, You laugh and fear and you laugh. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you so much, Hayley. Uh, and last but certainly not least, uh, I'd like to introduce everybody to Lisa Zwendi from the Eastern Cape, playwright, actor, director, presenter, and educator, uh, mentor to learners from the Masifunde Learner Development Program who's been doing some incredible work in the M NMM. Alisa, thank you so much for being with us. And yeah, welcome, welcome. Look forward to hearing uh, you. Hello, everyone. Yes, I think everyone has just had a mouthful. Uh, I, must, I must say, um, I've been going to the National Arts Festival for the past 14 years. I'm right behind you, Rob. Right behind you. Um, it's, quite, it's quite an interesting time that we're in. As you, as you just mentioned that I work with um, quite a lot of different um, NGOs. I mean, I work at the P Opera House as the artistic producer there of the work. So definitely it has had a knock on the artists as well that are there. So everyone has went into a frenzy and a panic on what will happen next. But um, luckily we had a session. We sat with, um, with the local TV station we sat with, um, with the NPOs on trying to see what creative ways we can have content to publish online on TV so that people can have access to that. You know, and I think a lot of people have TV, they will not maybe complain of not having much more access to Wi-Fi or data. So we decided to go the local TV station route to produce, produce work and content for that. Um, as you know, I, I, I'm also an educator. So I have about 50 kids coming in at once here at Masfun and Learner Development on a day, you know, um, because I work on, I do musicals with them. So 50 of them will come in, we rehearse, 
for her song and dance. So now it was quite a knock as well for them because it's lockdown, they have to be at home. So no one is allowed to come in. So I had to think of new creative ways to make sure that they stay active and also the space that we are using is also used as well. It keeps on generating income and they are coming to the space. Um, so I've created a body of work, a body of work that will allow them to have the space coming in one by one. Um, also, we have a DOP, someone who does our videos for them coming in one by one so that we can record work and we can publish it on online and on the TV station and also do some work for the National Arts Festival. For the, for the maybe we'll put it on the V fringe uh, also for people to view. Um, the, other, the other part which was quite hectic was me trying to teach <laughs> drama online. I know it's available already. People are also always uh, teaching drama online. For me it was something new because I'm used to contact. So whatever I do, I do practically so that yeah. the youth can see what we're doing. They practice it whilst we talk about um, drama elements, for instance. So it was, it was also, like Rob said, it's quite a nice way because it's a new space. I said to the, to the DOP the other day that I don't know what I'm doing, but let's do it. See the outcome later on, you know? So it's a new space, it's exciting. You just need to just swim, just go through the tide, you know. Um, also, with 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 getting the 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 boost of of working on on TV as well was quite it was quite nice because we want to create something new. Like we always on social media already, so they have access to to videos, two minute videos, three minute videos. So it creates a little bit of a platform for those people who wanted to use that platform like Haley said people don't have now the, the access of choosing whether to go to the restaurant or the theater. they have to be like here on 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 the like whether it's live stream or pre-recorded whether it's published out there so they have the access to just go in on their phones and see but it's all up to you on how you create this this imaginary world for them because, you know, we, we are theater makers, we, we like creating this world, you know, to let our audience migrate to a different space. So the migration now, it's, it's limited to a box for you to be there, but it's, a, it's an interesting concept. Then we need to always think creatively, how do we make sure our audience move with us in this little box that we are going to show them theater working? because we don't want it to look like a soap opera. We want it to still have that theater feel, that, that authentic um, creativeness that we, we, we produce, you know? So it's, a, it's a, quite a, a difficult challenge, but it's a challenge that we need to go through. And I think we'll go through it already because I work in a community of, uh, of a lot of people. A lot of people are already asking, when are the videos we've been shooting coming out because they're quite interested in what what we're doing they want to see us do stuff you know they want to post it on on their status on the statuses on whatsapp want to post it on facebook whether it's instagram they want to to post something new and authentic and i think this this space this digital space is giving us that platform is giving us that leeway to also reach out to an audience abroad that we haven't tapped into yet um, Tandila spoke about collaboration, which is quite well. And it's, these are the things that um, if you've ever had a contact overseas that you always connect with, this is a great platform to see now how you can merge work, you know, in different continents, how you can create interesting piece of theater, you know, some people to watch. Um, so I've tried doing some educational videos, which are quite difficult trying to, to imagine the learners. Um, as we work with Mpuma Kappa TV, so we try to get a, a space of about, about 30 minutes in edu edutainment, we call it, um, a quarantine TV, quarantine TV in full. Mm -hmm. So we try to, to give them life skills in the space of 30 minutes. We try to push in um, the arts and music, drama, um, 
uh, also in visual arts. We also have um, a person who does healthy living, cooking. So we try to keep the youth entertained as much as we can in the small space that we got in the TV scene. And hopefully they will stretch that uh, and give us more airtime during this time. I think that's um, a platform that we are using as the NPOs and the P-Opera House um, in this period of time. Thank you. No, thank you so much. That's fascinating. Um, and this is ongoing. This has already started. It's rolling out. It's incredible. This has already started. Yes. I think we've been um, doing it last month. Wow. So I think we only got back to shooting soapies and Cape Town's only started opening up in the last week or so. So that's that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as a fellow educator, absolutely. That idea of presence in the in the in the teaching room or the rehearsal room. I mean, let alone performance and stuff like that. That is such a huge thing to grapple with. Um, um, but yeah, it's exciting and nerve-wracking and frightening and all of these things. But yeah, thank you all very much for that uh, introduction to the wonderful stuff that you're doing. Um, it's quite interesting over the last seven, seven, how long have we been in A long time. Um, the last seven weeks being locked down, um, there's been so much content suddenly on, on the internet in particular. Um, and it's been amazing to catch up with stuff that's happening all over the world, whether that is archive footage that suddenly has just been made available, which is fantastic. Um, a researcher's dream, absolutely. And then some very, very interesting things. And it's, um, people are mentioning the, uh, the National Theatre and they're sort of live streaming stuff. And there's been some incredible work on there. And you kind of go, wow, if only we had a, ah, a whole bunch of zeros at the end of our, of our funding to actually be able to do something on that scale. There's also been uh, wonderful stuff in uh, the Netherlands where uh, companies have built a virtual theater where you can go into the lobby, you can order drinks, you can go into the toilets and have a conversation with somebody else. You can watch the whole show, you can chat afterwards, and is thinking about creating this kind of platform where companies can hire the space, um, which is incredible. So all these things are happening, but I think what has really started now um, as we've gone into it is that we're starting to get a lot more specific. Like, How do we deal with it? Where are the articles about South African work and the, the challenges that we are facing? And not, and not just looking overseas and going, no, oh, we must do what they're doing, but actually like dealing with the here and now. So thank you. And thank you for like just absolutely mooding all my questions. Let's start again, shall we? Right. I have been told by people in the wings that we need to get the hell on. So we're going to turn to a question. There's a question that has come up on, uh, from an audience member. Um, this comes from Muhammad Ali. Thank you very much. Uh, he says, greetings. And this is a question for the whole panel. Does theater not lose its essence and purpose as soon as it enters the digital platform where it now competes with film? Why force theater to a platform that disintegrates its power? Who would like to take that one on first? Bandisi, over to you. So why force theater to a platform that disintegrates its power? Does it not lose its essence and purpose? Thank you. The, the essence of theater is communicating, you know. Um, uh, so if, if theater can still communicate its message, you know, it's, mm. there's nothing wrong with that, you know. Um, so, I, I, I mean, I, I did allude to the fact that I've watched plays from the National. I've watched plays from uh, the Met. You know, I've watched plays from everywhere in the world and I've gotten the, the, the sense of them. You know, everything was, was not lost to me. The only thing that happened was that I was, not, I was not in the room because the performers were not playing for me personally in South Africa sitting in my room. They yeah. were playing, you know, they were playing the piece of work first as they, they were presenting the piece of work sincerely and with truth. 
you know mm. we cannot if, even in at this stage we cannot lose the the, the essence of the art yeah you know, we can what i mean i mean it's easy for us to start worrying about the camera angles uh the, the the gigabytes the speed of this and the speed of that and yet and we forget what makes people come and watch us is the feeling they get from our art so the art needs to stay as the centerpiece of what we're doing and everything else will take care of itself lovely thank you very much Haley. you had your hand up Go over to you. Uh, I mean, I, I guess the the question is quite simple. Why force it into the space? We don't have a choice. Right now, we don't know what the world is going to look like. This is where we're at, and if and and artists can choose whether or not they go into the space. If they're not going to go into the space, then they'll have to do something else to survive to stay present. Yeah. Um, but the the simple answer is because we have to, and. If we wanted, you know, the sort of silver lining, if you want to see it, is that we can use this as an opportunity to grow our skills, grow our audiences, um, yeah, create that more intimate relationship. I don't know so much about having a digital conversation with someone in the bathroom, but, you know, that we can, we can continue to be present. And, but you don't have to. If it, if it doesn't, I think Mandisi was also saying, like, mm. it doesn't resonate with you. If it's not your art, you don't have to put yourself under the pressure to make it. You are going to have to do something. You're going to have to do something else. And I believe that there will be a time where we'll be back in the theater. And what we, at what we need to as artists be aware of now is how we can use this as an opportunity to grow the audiences, not chase them away. But it's not going to mean that there's not live theater at the end of the day. We still have to practice as artists. We still have to, part of our rituals as at performers is to stay performance fit. That's all got to stay, and this is just a means of doing that. Uh, absolutely. Um, and as you said, you cannot compete to the restaurants anymore, but you can actually order out and watch theatre at the same time. Amazing. Uh, Tandile, you had your hand up as well. We'll cross over to you. And then, Rob, I feel it's to you. Yeah? Thanks, Rob. Um, so, Rob from Fearin mentioned something very. Um, Important, Mohammed. <laughs> Mohammed, we are at the genesis of something so great. One of, um, I think it was Nina Simone said something about, or somebody said, um, the artist's work is to reflect the times. Um, and then I also, I want to quickly jump into a question I've had to ask myself about my work. What is it that my work seeks to do? And then I go to Haley about, then that's when you can decide whether to participate or not. How is this going to serve your message? Is it going to, how is it going to serve your message? I know my work wants to create space for black, queer, and people of color bodies and, and, create, and talk about that kind of subject matter. What a great way to have, as Mandisi said earlier, several thousands of people that are going to consume that as opposed to 200 people. Again, Mandisi said this, uh, about um, theater is, is for communication. It depends, Mohammed Bana, what is the purpose of your theater? Or like, what is the purpose of theater? We need to maybe go back to that, but what is the purpose of theater? If it really is to communicate, then you are reaching further, way further than what we, we, we were able to do with theaters and, and such performance spaces. So I think, yeah, it's, we're at the genesis. Get on if you feel like this serves your work. This is the best time somebody also said, and Michali also said a couple of, Michali and Damas said, two, three weeks ago that this is the best time to start anything online. Rob just said now that there's so much content online, do it. There are no gatekeepers, hey, <laughs> you know, um, and gatekeepers as access. Well, I'll speak about that more later, but really, mm. a part of it if it serves your work and ask your question, what is it that your work is wanting to do and how will this best, you know, feed your work? Awesome. Thank you very much, Tandile. We're gonna go to Rob and then we're gonna move to another question. That is yeah, just to add on what everyone said, I, I, com I agree completely. Um, we don't have a choice uh, uh, and we're in the space now and we, we're just going for it and you see what happened. But I think it's also important to, to kind of uh, uh, take a bigger perspective on things. We're, we're talking from the point of view of artists. I had an amazing conversation with Tatsun Konza the other day and he said, you know, what I've thought about is I am a creative and uh, I am an artist. And the way that I've chosen to express that is through stand-up comedy. 
But at my core, I'm creative. And I'm now sitting in this problem right now of how do I express my creativity? It doesn't necessarily have to be that thing that we've chosen. Um, and I think all of us at our core are just expressing that creative urge. And we've, we have been got so caught up in the medium that we use and we think that defines us. It doesn't. We are artists and we are creating as we go and we're adapting to whatever is happening. You know, if whatever happens, we will still at the end of the day be artists and we will need to express ourselves however we can. So again, we don't have a choice as artists. Is it different? Absolutely. Do we miss the feeling, the touch, the taste, the smell of yeah. other people reacting in the space with us? Of course. But there's other things we're exploring and, and realizing that are like, oh, wow, that's super exciting. And yes, we, life theater, we, it will always go back there. Eventually, we'll be back in spaces like that. But at the end of this, you're going to have this other thing that also exists. And if you embrace it, you now have another aspect of how you express yourself as an artist. Yeah. Another income stream, perhaps. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's pretty exciting. And, I th and again, I say, like, go now. This is the time. Make mistakes. Do it. Don't wait for it to be perfect. Don't wait for someone else to let you know how it works. No one knows how it works. No one knows right now. We're all like fiddling around. So right now is the best time to get involved. You don't have to, but if you don't, I think you're missing a golden opportunity to really explore who you are as an artist and what your work is about, as Tandile said. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, I don't know, there was a beautiful post this morning uh, on the socials. It was uh, Bianca Flanders who wrote this epic sort of love song letter to theater and just saying how much she missed it and all the calls and the smells and the dressing rooms and what have you. And I think, yeah, we all love that life and miss it terribly. But here's a burning question, maybe to throw out to the panel. Um, and this, this was one, and we've touched on it. We've, we've touched on gatekeepers. We've touched on access and all these sorts of things. And we have faced, as we've also talked about, with one of the most epic moments in the history of performing arts and the question is do we go back to it yes we miss that liveness but do we go back to the way it was or do we take that responsibility as creatives and creative or um, art leaders and just reset completely um, I've seen this conversation go on uh, in places like in Europe and, and uh, North America and stuff like that, where most of the gatekeepers are older and let's face it, white cis males. And they are, and, and they create this little box, like I think also the South African industry to some extent is a, it's a, maybe a smaller box, but it is a box. And when you're, when you're young and upcoming, you can rebel against stuff. You can, you know, like try and break that and, and go, uh, yeah, break all the rules and stuff like that. And then you start getting a little bit more successful and what have you, and you start fitting into that box. And I suppose that question is not, do we have to go back? There will always be an element of liveness, but do we have to go back to those theaters and those spaces? Or do we have this golden opportunity <laughs> to reinvent the whole thing? Haley's like, yes, yes, we do. Come back to pop art. <laughs> No, pop is closed. <laughs> it's a new thing, you know? It's, the whole thing has become new. Yeah. Um, so I don't know what people think about that. Um, Nikki, you've got your hand up. Thank you very much. Yeah. I mean, um, I think the obvious answer is that it's like, yes, and, right? Like, yes, we'll always go, but we'll always have theatre. We, we are lusting for that. I just... I mean, even with all like my techie queen situation, I cannot wait to go and have that live exchange, that kind of sacred ritualistic nowness. Um, but I think that there's something quite exciting. So in when I was kind of first tapping into this and, and doing a lot of like uh, um, quantitative research on what, what, the, what the numbers say, um, what was so interesting about the national live was that their live audiences expanded. It got even fuller, 
the, it didn't matter that it was being broadcast and people were watching it. People, more people were going like, oh my gosh, and more people went to go watch. So actually, I think it's more, it's, it's, it's a tool to fill those spaces a little bit more. And on the point that you made in terms of like, who owns those spaces and how we curate them. I think what's been so interesting for me as a younger kind of maker is that I have, I've been blocked because I'm like, guys, I have this idea. It will be virtual and it will be Pan-African and all of these things. And people are like, cool, cool, yeah, yeah, yeah. But first we need to prioritize these people and then actually your budget, why is your budget asking for so much? We only have like, you know, a couple thousand for mm. you. I'm like, I hear you, but like, as Mandisi is saying, we totally like need those things to experiment, don't you think? Um, so I, I will say that there's been a really interesting moment for me, you know, after my three week morning, uh, you know, when we first hit lockdown to go like, cool, next, like you've done this before. And actually you're really interested about finding collaboration dare I say, like querying a process, you know? I really like the idea of going like, this hasn't been done before, and now we have to like reinvent um, all of these things. And there isn't a right way, you know? And in a way we can think of what competition means, but actually there's something really exciting in terms of like who gets to be on screen and how that happens in a way that like is really, really, still backward and who and you know and part of that is who occupies or who kind of is in the bigger mechanics of of theatrical spaces um yeah so i'm gonna, I'm gonna end there thank you so much thank you yeah Haley, you had your hand up if you'd like to add to that uh yeah i mean one of the things for me is like this is why must we go through all of this if everything's going to go back to normal and i mean that in every facet you know um of course this should shake the way things are done. Um, mm. And we know that our spaces are problematic. We know that the gatekeeping is problematic. And now I think this is also a really great opportunity for artists to capitalize on their value, to, show, to be able to go like, this is what I'm worth and this is what I can do on my own. And if you want me in your space, it's gonna cost more. It's gonna be worth more. Because you'll also, you know, the thing about National Theatre Live's audience is growing, it's not a secret. People follow people. They don't, mm. they don't follow spaces. They follow people. So if you are staying somehow in touch with an audience during this time, then you're able to bring a live audience to a space. And that has, that has got value in, in spaces. So, yeah, I mean, also, I guess I've been watching quite a lot of stuff on like Corona capitalism and like fighting that and I guess this idea of online activism not being slacktivism, like how do we organize online and how do we fight for the access that is needed is that all that artists can be drawn to eventually once like once this grieving has passed because it is it's a big amount of grieving I mean we're privileged enough to work as practicing artists in the space if you had your year lined up by like some miracle from God that you actually had a year lined up, it's a lot of grieving that had to happen. So yeah, I think for me, it's also this, how do you organize online for the things that matter? Because artists are also, that's what we're here for. Mm. But we're still, we're still, we still like, we don't want to react, we have to respond. So we are still taking it in. Absolutely, yeah. I think, uh, that's one of the huge things that hit all of us, you know, when we're just suddenly like, oh, lockdown, there you go. And I was like, right, we're going we're gonna to seize this. We're going to still rehearse online. We're going to make stuff. We're going to learn languages. We're going to learn how to play that ukulele finally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then brick wall. And as everybody's saying, like, yeah, you had to take a week, two weeks to just shut down or just, like, deal with it all. And it's, it is, I think, one of these huge things that we as artists always grapple with, and particularly now, um, we can talk about virtual theatre or online theatre or something, but the actual fact is we're dealing with pandemic theatre right now. You know, we're still in the middle of grappling with the pandemic that is on a global scale. Um, 
so something to always yeah how do we teach how do we um how do we create work how do we present that work or exhibit that work and i want to pick up and there's another question from our audience uh for tandile to start with uh thank you very much uh this comes from Siposeto. Um, I love and resonate with everything you've said in your presentation. I just find difficulty in terms of collaboration now with the current pandemic. I do poetry and have to make it appeal to the online audience, but there are no resources and no offerings to appreciate artists. Any advice or any response to Siposeto there? Hi, hi Siposeto. So, um, look, I. I I want to say, let's move from working with the, what do we not have, this deficit model. Um, mm. As I say, what do you have? Um, what resources do you have in front of you now? What offerings are there right now? The VNAF um, fringe is on as one of them. Um, what does collaboration look like now? Because surely it's going to take a new form or like it's, it's, it's going to, you know, the, the, the meaning of it will morph into what it needs, what the needs for now will be, you know? Mm. So um, all I can really say is, is honestly, just let, let's just look at what we have first before we cloud ourselves. I could have easily just shut down after hearing that the, the, um, the National Arts Festival is going virtual because really my original work was to have a group of queer people in a church hall or in a defunct sp space somewhere in Makanda and we have a huge ass ball. But there would have been limitations there of space and numbers. So now with this virtualness of this festival, there are no limitations. Mm -hmm. this, this, I, this thing that I, I, would, I, would, I would like to do it can reach a, a, a lounge. Ideally, if you know, a family full of like, you, you, you can think of your family dynamic, who the reach is very, very, there's more. So I, I, let's work from what we have first. And then we can realistically, this is not to say that, you know, we are not going to look at what um, the limitations are. The limitations are really, of course, they are there. But mm. let's look at what do we have now in front of us. Mm. And then we can work from there. Deficit model, eight, the window. <laughs> Or to, or to quote President Ramaphosa, it's over. It's over. <laughs> it's over. Like hugs and kisses. It's over. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Uh, thank you so much. I think it resonates to a lot of what we've been saying about this idea is that the reach is just expanding. And I mean, the fact that somebody is watching the most amazing show in Antarctica, seriously? <laughs> Incredible. Yeah. You know? And the fact that we've got a whole bunch of international people sitting in on, on the webinar. It's also, it's also great. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, totally. And this thing that's emerging that we keep talking about, you know, and it's our, our thing to grab hold of it because that's what artists do. Um, uh, Ishmael Mohammed uh, keeps talking about us as canaries in the coal mine. You know, we're right at the forefront of things of developing. And, and I think that's such an apt um allegory or metaphor for that okay we have uh, a question and geez, we are so running out of time how about that uh this is from shamla i think this is shamla hi sham how are you uh who says all of this is amazing it is wonderful to witness this conversation thank you so much i guess my question is around finance another burning question how will collaboration happen in such a way that artists may be able to continue making and producing but sustaining themselves I guess there's a large responsibility of the audience, but how does that exist in the space we want, in the space we find ourselves? Um, before, I'm gonna give this over to the panel, but Sham, um, also there will be another, uh, there are a number of webinars. Next week, there is a webinar on the technical requirements about taking work online um, and all, all the things that we need for that. And the week after that, which is the 29th of May, there will be a webinar on marketing for stuff online, which I think will also talk to a lot of that. But uh, panel, would anyone like to, panelists, I beg your pardon, would anyone like to jump in on this one? Sorry, Karen. Yeah? Um, look, finances, I think, just first and foremost, we have to just acknowledge that we will, things will cost more. 
um, because there's just a lot of, um, as Manjis said, quality. We, we, we want to put out quality work, right? And you're not going to do a makeshift thing. You want to get the people that are skilled in that thing to do it. So I think more than anything, we need to be honest about that fact that it will cost more. Um, and work from there. <laughs> really, I can't say more. You know, yeah. Just... Yeah, no, I, th I think, I mean, this whole idea of, of quality is something that Mickey Spaulding, the uh, technical director of the National Arts Festival, talked about in the very first webinar, you know, that it is a different thing. And yeah, we can do amazing things um, with little puppets and little, uh, I was watching the Book of Mormon with these two little, um, like, sticky notes doing the different characters. It's incredible. Those are fun. Um, but also we need to, you know, if, we, if, we are, uh, if we've got music, the music needs to be heard. If there's spoken word, that needs to be clear. What is the lighting like and stuff like that? Um, and that's obviously gear uh, that, that we need and also the ability to work with it. Mandisa, you had your hand up. You want to jump in on this um, question, this comment? Yes. Um, there's, a, there's a few things that um, artists we are going to need to to look at and be very hip to as as jazz musicians always say um one is that you need to know your your rights as an artist you know because now people are coming and say hey can you put stuff on my platform you know um what and, and then there's percentages ridiculous percentages like you are creating all the art and you are getting 10% you know, um, you know, we know, <laughs> we know that uh, for the VNF, uh, um, I can't even say it, you're getting 90%, you know, which is already, that's a standard, that's good. You know, people should so concentrate on the uh, be hip in, in terms of what they're getting. Also, um, are you, when some streaming companies are gonna come and say, okay, fine, for a, if you want us for an hour, this is what you pay. You know, but other people are going to start giving deals and say, okay, we'll take 60% mm -hmm. and all of those things. So those are the, uh, um, some of the things that as we are, as artists need to start to think about very quick. And then the other thing, which is a, a point of friction is ownership. You know, so a lot of artists are putting out stuff on, on, on these um, uh, uh, platforms what a, you must have a contract you know please have a contract are you allowing it to be shown live or does it last for 48 hours you know and if it lasts for 48 hours and more people go and watch do you get something you know because when you were playing it live you might have been watched by a thousand people right and so you got a uh, payment for those thousand people but now it lasted for 48 um uh, hours and and then you look after for eight hours you've got thirty thousand people but you don't get anything out for that you know it's things like that and then can or can the platform put it up again you know um for for reuse and stuff like that and when that happens you know do you get something and so all of those things yes we we knew but we need to be very careful you know because not everyone is good willed you know, every, people are seeing opportunities at, 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 at making a lot of money. You know, I know for a fact, artists don't know what happens in the data world. You need to get hip to exactly what's getting on, on, the, on the, that data world and what viewership means, all of those things and what it means monetary, you know, so that if, if you know, and also the, the last thing is that artists do not be scared of putting money to make money you know mm. because you will you will you will cut a lot of these uh problems that are are, are starting mm. to creep up now you know and 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 i hope that um all the young artists are listening to this one excellent thank you. uh yeah uh totally i th i think um as rob was talking about earlier as well there's this yeah we can rush out and do stuff as much as possible and there's certainly uh, there's a bit of a train of newness or novelty that we can ride for so long and then we're going to have, need to start looking at, at quality and things and Rob you're going to jump in line with that one <laughs> um, 
yeah, it does cost money to to go to become uh, to create uh, things of better quality um, because there's so much out there as as we've been talking about. You know, there's so much out there that's free. There are people, there are vloggers, there are Instagram influencers who've been doing this for like 10, 15 years or what have you. Um, you know, and we are now competing. Uh, we've always been competing with them, but not necessarily in their turf. Yeah. Haley, you had your hand up, Sandile and Rob, and then we are going to need to very quickly steam towards the close. Haley. Um, yeah, I mean, we're not only competing with competing with bloggers, we're competing with National Theatre Live, you know, so yeah. I do, I, I think that the, the sort of financial models have kind of taken a bit of a, like, they have not been brought to the forefront just yet, even us as a space where you'd like, because we can't guarantee the quality of the content and we want to make a space to experiment and find out what the hell we're doing can't charge for it so we've been like going on a donations model for the moment which also because it's like it's so economically uncertain so what's great about donations is some people will give you lots of money and some people will watch for free which i think is great it answers certainly for me it answers a question another question of access a different kind of question of access about who can access our work without it being like problematically compy as it often is in you know in real life um but yeah, I think one uh, definitely like a caution to artists and also like be aware of how the platforms you use make their money because that'll help you understand like what your viewership is bringing to the party. So yeah, that's when choosing platforms to go out onto because this is like you build an audience, build an audience and then you make money if you go into the conventional sense. So you either get a brand sponsor, which is yours or they'll start making advertising money off you. So yeah, that's just, just something to like start becoming aware of is how is everyone else making money off of you? Which we should uh, know as artists anyway. We should, <laughs> totally. Um, yeah, it's, and, it's, and it goes back to the idea of community. How do we make communities again? Um, not only in terms of the people that we hang out with um, or we teach, how do we build that community of audiences? How do we try and localize it within this global, this global world again. Yeah. Uh, Tandili, we're going to jump over to you very quickly, then to Rob, then we unfortunately are going to need to wrap this up, but over to you. Cool. Just real quickly, um, I get young artists get re representation, and this is another wing of collaboration. Get hmm. representation. Get people that know what is happening where and how, right? If you, I mean, there's a lot for us. We can't focus on... Every, we can't do everything. We can't be creative and do it and, and actually do the thing here and then also look into the, the, the law and, and all and all. Get representation. There are a lot of young people that are opening, um, you know, honest um, companies of wanting to do talent management companies that are, are, are willing to do this kind of work that have legal representation and PR and, 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 and media representation and, and so forth. So like just seek and, and look for an honest group of people that you think you can work with and get in, get onto that thing so that you can be well versed about what is happening around you. How are people making money and how you are making money and name your price. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, Rob, uh, over to you for the last on this. Um, yeah, up until this question, I think we've been dealing mostly with the problem of creating work as artists, making work. This is a whole other thing that could mm. be a whole other webinar, which is the problem of monetizing it uh, and or financing it. Um, so this, it's a lot here. And, um, you know, Tandile mentioned, if you're talking about budgets and things like that, and, you know, don't undercut you in terms of your budget and what you're worth, know your senses, know what your worth is. I think as everyone is, has touched on, but I also want to say just to the, to the artists who aren't necessarily established enough to have access to a funding system, uh, or even established artists who are, who, uh, who, who, who aren't, uh, who don't have access to, I'm talk, just talking about like, what can you do now? If you're sitting at home, you're an artist, but you just don't, like, how do I monetize? I think the first step is to just, first of all, start the conversation with your audience. Like, you, you have an audience, even if it's three people at this stage, 
Mm. Go online, whether on whatever platform you're comfortable with. And if you're not comfortable with any, start to get comfortable with it and just start the conversation. Um, and then once you're starting to feel comfortable with actually engaging with your audience, you will slowly find out how to grow your audience um, and then start exploring ideas of how do I monetize this? And, it's, and it is about training our audiences into, into recalibrating about how they spend money on the content that they want. Um, and there are lots of different ways of doing it. There's no set way. There's no rules. You can do donations. You can set up your own donations. There's uh, a company called Busker that has put out little QR codes that you mm. can get the majority of it from you can, you, and you can raise funds like that. You can do ticketed systems. There are lots of different people using uh, different ticketed systems and it's constantly changing. So I think it's about not, nothing set in stone. Nothing is right or wrong. And if you want to, just the only way you're going to figure it out is to start playing with it. Just start engaging with it and start small if you want to. And just like, you know, five minutes, prepare five minutes and say, hey, perform to five people. And do you, would you like to make a donation? No amount is too small. You get a little, maybe you've got some money to, to buy some groceries for a day or two. You've also engaged with your audience. You're teaching them how to spend money on, in this new economy. Uh, you're teaching yourself how to accept the new economy. And I think that that's a part of how it's also going to evolve from a ground level up as well. I think, I think it, more than anything, this particular zeitgeist suits very small independent art makers who have previously not had advantage to these kind of more uh, in, uh, entrenched systems. Mm. It's the, it is the fringe artists who can really actually really benefit from this new system if you just start engaging with it. It's lovely. I was reading a, uh, an article this morning um, by Stephen Sachs, who's a director of a Los Angeles theater, and he was quoting, weirdly, Shakespeare in Love, um, written by Tom Stoppard. And in it, uh, Henslow, who is the um, Forever in Debt uh, producer, says, Mr. Fennyman, allow me to explain about the theater business. The natural condition is one of insurmountable obstacles on the road to imminent disaster. Fenneman says, so what do we do? Henslow replies, nothing. Strangely enough, it all turns out well. Fenneman, how? Henslow, I don't know. It's a mystery. Um, but I think it's, it's that, that weird thing. Is this, people have been saying this is in our DNA. You know, this is as fringe artists, as people and, uh, yeah, who are not completely um, embedded into the establishment. And if, I think from today's talk, there's been so much... Uh, positivity and that was one thing one of my questions was going to be like how is everybody doing in this time of pandemic and you guys are amazingly positive like, so, so thank you for that thank you for that energy and we've had some questions and, and comments that we haven't been able to get to some people asking about like maybe is, is some of this sort of utopian and maybe it is sure but I think that's also very necessary um, as we dream of a um, not only what's happening now, what's now, but what's happening next. You know, how can the things that we do now, the opportunity that we've all spoken about, that's been given to us, how can we grab hold of it to really, really influence what is coming next? Yeah. Um, I'm going to, uh, there's an, from the attendee side, from our audience, um, there's just a comment uh, from Sanyan. Thank you for this, Sanyan. And lovely to almost see you. Uh, maybe one aspect that we as theatre makers can really focus on as the thing that might translate very well into the digital space is interactivity. You know, we've, we've touched on this throughout this, and it, that's a whole webinar <laughs> in and of itself as well. The magic of theatre is that it's made right in front of you, and live digital space has some of that. You can build stories or performances that get the audience to engage directly with you as the performer, and build stories and experiences together. And the audience member might feel like it's just for them in front of their screens. And everybody who tunes in might feel the same as well, which is amazing. We have unfortunately completely run out of time, but this has been a really, really fascinating chat. I want to thank each and every one of you, uh, panelists, uh, for being here and for just really engaging with it all. Um, I know we've gone slightly over, but if we can just run through, um, and instead of giving us three words of advice, if we can just very succinctly give one last bam out to any young 
um, or up-and-coming uh, performance makers. Let's start, Nikki, with you, and if we can just, uh, Ryan, if we can just unmute everybody. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Collaborate with people, collaborate through mediums, collaborate in different spaces. Beautiful, thank you very much. Tandile. Stick to that ritual. I know I said it before, but really to take care, to take care of, the, of yourself first, it's that you are able to create, get into that ritual of being okay with and, and get, getting in touch with yourself. I love it. I, that's the only way I, I'm doing it. Beautiful, thank you. Hayley. Um, you don't need to be first or right. You need to make work that's important to you. And that's awesome. urgent. Lovely. Rob. Uh, Self-care, mental uh, wellness, uh, embrace the problem, follow your curiosity, and make stuff. Awesome. Thank you very much. Mandisi. Yeah, heal yourself first. Heal yourself oh. and, and use that art to heal you first. And whatever you put out will resonate to, to the people. Awesome. Thank you. Kadisa. Start with the community. Start small and build, build, build your base, and then it will go by itself. You know, talent, talent, talent will always speak for you. If you're good at what you're doing and you know what you're doing, just go for it. Don't be scared, just swim. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. And thank you, everybody who's tuned in and been watching uh, this and participating in it. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you to the National Arts Festival for giving us this platform. This, as I said at the beginning, has been recorded. And as soon as... Um, we are able to, it will be uploaded onto the National Arts Festival website, which is nationalartsfestival.co.za. Um, please check out all the exciting new developments in terms of the virtual fringe or the V fringe. Um, and also tune back next Friday, that's the 22nd of May, for part two of this creative process, which is looking at technical stuff about the National Arts Festival, well, about putting work online. And then on the 29th of May, which will be looking at marketing and promotional uh, aspects to putting work online. Thank you once again, all panelists. I wish it were level three and we could all meet at a virtual bar somewhere to have a glass of wine. Um, but have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. And thank you for all your input and your enthusiasm. Thank you. Take care and goodbye.